Welcome to Working Better Together. Today's guest is Richard Mulholland, former rock roadie turned business owner, published author, and highly regarded public speaker. Richard is the founder of Missing Link, South Africa's largest presentation firm, and now runs a number of other businesses under his holding company, Cultivation. Okay, cool. I'm Gary. I'm the CEO of High Five, and today we've got Richie Mahalan. Richie is the founder of Missing Link. Um, who is situated in Joburg, but actually currently lives in Cape Town. We're keen to find out more about that. But what's uh, really exciting, he just published a book called Legacide, and he's now running a company called Cultivation. So just really keen to find out. I mean, he's got some really amazing insight with working within, within various companies um, and lots of experience with innovation and just disrupting culture. So keen to find out more about you. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Gary. How's it going? Good, good. Busy? Busy, isn't yeah. it? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's not crappy. Yeah, um, we're just on a massive recruiting binge right now, so it's the, the struggle's real, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And yourself, so tell me more about your background and how you got into where you are today. I mean, you, you, I mean, you ran uh, Missing Link for almost like 20 years, you know, and, and tell me the transition now to, to this new company. Well, so what happened? I started Missing Link, yes, I'm 43 now. I started it when I was 22, and Missing Link's 21 years old. Uh, uh, this year and basically I kept on going through the phase when I started it I had a whole bunch of businesses I had a company called Padded Cell, uh, CJD Distribution, The Asylum and I remember meeting this business coach on a plane and we were struggling to grow the businesses his name was Wolf Fosser um, and hey, what was enough, his name? What was his name? Wolf Fosser okay brilliant yeah um, and I guess the the kind of full circle is that the guy who's now my business coach Brent Spilkin we met with Wolf Fosser. Yeah, we were in the same kind of coaching group. Anyway, uh, he said to me, I said to him, I phoned him, I met him on a plane, I phoned him, I said, listen, I'd love to be coached. He said, no problem, he's this German. He says, but I will coach you on any one of your businesses, but only one. <laughs> Pick your favorite. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, cool, right, I'll do Missing Link. And for about uh, 10 years, that's all I focus on. And I remember going to him about 10 years later and saying to him, listen, I feel like I want to grow more, I want to do those things. He says, okay, now it's time. And over the last few years, I've tried to get in and I've tried to get out of Missing Link constantly. We launched other companies. Uh, Don Packett and I launched 21 Tanks and we grew it. And um, I would always be sucked back in. And it was only properly last year, September, Don, who is my business partner at Missing Link, he said that he would take over. He's running it. He's already doing a much better job than me, which is shit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Well, that's a good and, thing. Oh, of course, it's a good yeah. thing. It's amazing. And there was never any doubt of it. Uh, but... There's a, I was able to focus on the holding company, Cultivation, mm. and Cultivation's whole thing is cultivating innovative businesses. So every February, we go on a trip called SnowCon. Uh, we, myself, Don, uh, it's always the two of us, and then there's usually other friends who are entrepreneurs and things, and we come up with an idea for a new business. So we conceptualize it in February, and we launch it in July. Well, tell me more about the SnowCon. Is that, it sounds like an overseas trip in the snow. Yeah, so it's exactly what we do. So we yeah. snowboard all morning. Uh, we usually snowboard from about 10 to 4, and then we take a break for, uh, may, sometimes it depends on the riding, an hour and a half, and then we work from usually about 6.30 to midnight. And it's the most productive uh, week of my working year. Uh, we fix, we come up with the victory condition for Missing Link, so what is the, what is the condition under which we'll call Missing Link victorious this year? Yeah. We conceptualize around the different business problems uh, that we have around the different businesses, and then we we create a new company concept and we try already from there, like this year, the sales department, one of the new businesses from SnowCon already, we'd contacted the guy, we knew we wanted to work, we pitched him the idea from France, I think we were in, and uh, he said yes, we met him, we came back and he's now uh, been running it for two months. Oh, that's amazing. So tell yeah. me, I'm, I'm keen to, I think we're keen to learn just more, more about, I mean, your experience, I mean, it sounds like you get into the guts of companies, you know, and, and you quite, you're on this focus right now to, to eradicate legacy thinking, you know. So can you tell us more about just some of your experience with being involved in helping companies, you know, and some of the obvious things that they could fix? A bit of the backstory on that is that when Don and I began 21 Tanks, when we started 21 Tanks, it was a perspective lab. So uh, we believe that any group of smart people trying to s solve an innovation-based problem, it's never because they're not smart enough, right? You're a smart guy, 
but it's, it's because you're too smart and it becomes very hard to read the label from inside the bottle. And so you would hire a company like us. I mean, we're actually doing perspective work today. Uh, that's why I'm in this conference venue. And, and you're wearing a tie. Would, ah, yeah, yeah. We always like, we all have, we have a dress code. We always do <laughs> for facilitations. We're totally punk rock. And uh, we, we, we wanted to, we kept on thinking, we're going to do these big innovations. It's going to be super exciting. We're going to invent the next iPod. Like, we were like, ah, yeah. oh, it's going to be amazing. But it never happened. Because when we were dealing with big established businesses, the rules are different. It turns out in an established company, innovation doesn't happen when you start doing something new. Innovation happens when you stop doing something old. And this was the key. And this was, it was something we kept... Wait, say that again. Say that again. Say, I like that. Say. Uh, even a high five, right? Innovation, we often think of it as something that is something new. Yeah. But if you want innovation to happen in your business, you've actually got to stop doing something old. Like That Brilliant. is the yeah, critical yeah. thing. And the realization, the kind of mindset shift is that you have to realize that you're not saying you were wrong. You're yeah. just saying that you're no longer right. The right. hypothesis and assumption was built around a reality that was 100% true at the point at which you put it in place. But yeah. It may not be true now. So today we're working on a victory condition lab for a large uh, uh, pharmaceutical company. And it's a three-year process. And often the solution will be somewhat tech. Right? There's very few problems yeah. in today's day and age with isn't tech. However, we always say in the session that it is inconceivable that the tech solution that we start creating today will be the ultimate solution that solves the problem three years from now. Yeah. So you can get all gung ho and spend, pardon me, 100 million bucks on putting in this big software system, but understand it's got to change. And that's not a bad thing. That's just part of the iterative process under which innovation happens today. So. I mean, that was legacy. I wrote it. I lost it the day before my 40th birthday. So actually, you're a book behind. Uh, my next one comes out in like a month or so. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm keen to talk more about that now as well. What's the obvious things that like that companies have to change to adopt this thinking? Okay. So in any time you're solving a business problem, the first thing you have to look at are what are the constraints? Like, why is this not happening? Yeah. And as much as you'd want to say, so I do think the change happens from the top up or culture change happens from the top up in general. Uh, it can only happen with permission. So if you, you put in, if you put in two, three years ago, a high five, and this was like, you believe this is the best thing and everyone was excited and this is what it was. And, and, everyone be, and now uh, people are looking thinking, yeah, that's pretty shit now, right? That doesn't, uh, doesn't resonate anymore and there's better tools and there's better ways to do things. If you don't have a culture in which people can call you out and say, dude, that was amazing when you did it. However, I think there's a better way to do it now. Why? Because the problem has shifted. Yeah. So to me, the mechanism is very simple. At any given time, you look at anything. When you have it in your brainstorm, you're talking about a process or a system or a technology used in your business, mm -hmm. and you ask yourself this question. Question number one, uh, what problem were we solving when we put this in place? Right? And you think about it, and you think, okay, we were solving the problem with this. Then you say, is this still a problem? And it turns out, I can't tell you how often it turns out that actually when you think about it, you're like, shit, no, not really. That's not, or is this still the problem? Well, no, it's maybe still a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is now this. Cool, then you know, stop doing it. And if the answer is yes, then the second question in the flow chart to ask yourself is, is the way we solved it then still the best possible way to solve it now? Okay. And I the easy you. kind of headspace, if, if, I was, if I was leaving Missing Link today and starting a new company and I had to solve the same problem, but I still use Hype Drive for sale. Yeah. You know, for example, like, and if the answer is no, then why am I still using it a missing link? Yeah. If the answer is no, stop doing it. And if the answer is yes, you know, give yourself a high five because, yeah. because you're winning. And that's the mindset that happens when people don't do it. They become so invested. There's such a sunk cost that they become so invested in the system and process and thinking that went into a, a solution uh, and they forget. So we fall in love with solutions. But what we really need to do is to rekindle our love for the problem. It's always about the problem. Okay. Yeah. The solutions are interesting. So, I mean, I think you're hinting on like being agile, you know, and I think what do you see that large companies struggle to adopt this thinking as opposed to small companies? Or put it this way, do you think that larger companies can learn from smaller companies? I think often small companies struggle with it even more uh, yeah. because small companies like, say, a company like mine, I mean, Missing Link, uh, Don, Don is 37, and he's worked with me since he was 21. Donovan, our, our other next guy in charge, uh, has worked with me 19 or 21 years. 
you know, they graduated from the Richard Mulholland School of Business, and I had no fucking idea what I was doing. Yeah. Right? So, and I genuinely, and I'm not even being like, the fact that Don is able to make those changes. But now you're sitting, you've got a guy who is my business partner, he's my best friend, we're the small company, I've created this thing, we've grown together, we've done it. Now he's got to come in and say, mm, all that stuff, rich put in place, we've got to change it, it's wrong. I mean, while I go and I stayed at his house last night, like, what are you doing? My, you know, it almost is more, often more difficult because it's more personified. Yeah. So the system is, which put this in place, as opposed to this was put in place. So sometimes we see certain businesses are actually better able to do it, but it all comes, it does come down to the permission given by the leadership. I've yeah. always said that leaders, culture is just basically a series of permissions given by uh, leaders to, for their people to act a certain way. It's like the way shit happens when nobody's looking. Yeah. And I want to bridge the, 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 the culture topic with you. I mean, how do you think within larger companies, do you think there is a culture problem and what, is, what do you think the best way is to fix that? I think, I don't think there is a best way because I think it's very, very specific to the problem, right? Yeah. I, think, I think in large and small companies, there's a culture problem. I think culture is like... Uh, What's your definition was, of culture? That's maybe a good thing. Uh, the, way, the, way, the way things happen when nobody's looking, uh, right? That's so, culture, your culture of your business is how people act when you're out of the office. Yeah. Right? That's the culture. If everybody's like cheering and high-fiving and dancing every time you walk in the office, but when you leave, they're all bitching and moaning and hating and... Uh, you know, just sitting down, putting the earphones on and nobody's speaking, then that's your company culture. I think for me is the understanding that um, people don't create a culture. Some people create a culture. Yeah. We have this kind of feeling that all people are beautiful. and they, I mean, they all people are beautiful and they can all contribute. But I realize that for the most part, in every group of 10 people you have in a business, there's one person who's amazing. They're like a, a you know, a, 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 yeah, a sh rainbow shitting, you know, Bitcoin, right, mm. and then on the other side, you've got a Martha Falker, right, and you've got somebody who's killing your culture. So you've got these two people, and then you've got eight people in the middle of your business waiting to see whose gravity is stronger. And the problem is, usually, the negative person has the stronger gravity, right? You've seen this running a business. That one, just you know, that uh, Craig Rodney always used to tell me, um, you know, if you've got this big, massive Olympic swimming pool. And there's just one floating turd in the pool. Nobody swims, <laughs> right? It just takes one shit. Yeah. And, and so that happens. And what I've realized is that it's one or two people that can change the behavior of a company. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is to make sure that people know which behavior you're, you're uh, amplifying. Yeah. And it's amazing because we often amplify even by way of saying, and this will not be tolerated and we cannot do that. We often amplify by negative behavior, but we are often not good enough at amplifying positive. So you have to build mechanisms in your business. So, for example, missing link, we've got a thing called gas. Uh, we always say we want to hire people with a full gas tank. They give a shit, the tank must be full. We earned vouchers from other members of staff for demonstrating gas. So Berger demonstrated extreme give a shit this week because he, he jumped in and he helped me with this thing. And then they give him a voucher. It's like a small cash voucher, like 50 rand or something. It's small. It's like lunch. But... Everybody uh, is allowed to do it to anybody else in the company. More importantly, though, than any of that. So it is nice that somebody gets acknowledged by a peer. Yeah. More importantly, Don, he's running a company. He doesn't see all of these things. And he gets to stand up and say, uh, Berger helped so and so. That, and then he'll tell him, actually, to do it. And just so you guys didn't know, Berger had a massive deadline. And after he left the office helping with this thing, he was on the phone to me at 11 p.m. working on this deadline that he was doing, but he didn't complain. He didn't mention to anyone because he wanted to help. That is give a shit to the extreme. And everyone cheers. And it's cheesy, except that it's offensive. Right? When people cheer for you, when they mean it, it's, it's just what it is. So we're constantly trying to amplify the behavior we want to replicate. And the rad thing about it was, for years, we used to call this uh, cotton in the act. It was called Cotton the Act of Catching People Doing Things is Not Their Job. Mm. I remember once at the time, Sam, who was the MD, went up to, and uh, before, our guys mastering tapes at the end of a video shoot was a pain. So it used to often be that some of the younger guys would help the more experienced guys master their footage for them. And they would always write in, you know, so-and-so helped this guy master the footage. And it would always be the same thing. And it stopped happening. They all do help each other. It's just become so much of the way that we do things in the business now that it's just become culture. Like, we don't see that as special anymore. We see that as the way that we act. So now we've elevated to different forms of standing up. So and I, I thought that was pretty cool. So what you're saying is that, that there's almost a like enabler or a channel for 
employees to recognize each other continuously. And the important thing is that that management is making it fully transparent of who's being recognized for what and actually celebrating those good behaviors. On yeah, a it's very basis, important. Yeah. For man, it's very, very important that justice doesn't happen in isolation. I think it's good to have some centralized, vocal public. And it's just a great way to start a Monday morning. Brilliant. Okay, great. Well, listen, I know we're running out, for, uh, out of time, but I just want to kick off with a final few questions. So just give us a, give us a run on how you spend your day on average, yeah. So I have like a morning ritual, morning routine that I do every day, very, very briefly. I, I read a precision nutrition coaching thing that I do through Sleep Geek. So every day for a year, I get a lesson about how to eat. I read Eric Kruger's uh, Acta Non Verba email every single morning. I read the Daily Stoic. So I do three things of reading. And I open an app and I, I check every day I set a new day's resolution. Uh, I wanted to try, I wrote a blog post on this, I wanted to try hack the thinking around why New Year's resolutions fail, and I believe it's because we haven't built failure in. So the moment you say, I'm going to eat better, the moment you have one bad day, you're like, oh, I've broken it. So I built a mechanism of a year of daily resolutions that actually has failure planned. Like I expect to get oh, it wrong. Two days. Yeah. Uh, it's really cool. And so is, that that. is that an app you say? I uh, know I wrote a blog post with like a step by step guide. So I use the app Writer a Day, W R I T E A D A Y. And it's actually got a mechanism for doing it. So I measure it the day before. Did I make it? Did I not? I write my new one. Yeah. And then I go into the kind of journaling portion and I write what I call, and I guess this is more a more controversial one, but I write what I call a to do better list. And I think we all have to do lists, but I want a list of things I do better. And I reflect on the day before and I think, ah, oh, I was a bit of a shit then. I wish I hadn't done this. I wish I'd handled that better. And some people say I'm beating myself up about things, but I don't see it that way. I see it that I'm reflecting on ways to improve. And the side effect of that is being that now um, it started getting to the point that I'm finding myself acting, doing something. And as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, oh, you're going to write this down tomorrow. And then I change. Yeah. So, so I do that and I usually jump rope. So I jump rope almost every day. I, I do, I work with, you know, I follow guys on YouTube called the Jump Rope Dudes and I do, uh, quite a lot of active jump rope. And then I get to work. Uh, because I work in Cape Town mostly, almost all my work is via Zoom or Skype. I've got a guy I work with on Leaderspeak, one of the new businesses called Justin King, so he'll come over. We we'll usually work a couple of hours. I do intermittent fasting, so I'm, I start eating at about 12. And then I work, and then by 5 o'clock, I'm usually done, and my wife is starting to moan. I'll uh, try and spend some family time. Uh, by then, the kids will be home and shit. And uh, I usually after dinner I might spend about another thirty minutes online doing some emails and winding down, uh, but I try my best not to work too hard. I find work is overrated, and yeah. uh, we almost on any given day play a board game. I want to just jump on that quickly. How many tasks do you give yourself a day? When you say you give yourself like daily tasks to do, I know. So I give myself one New Day's resolution. Okay. okay. Right. So it's one per day New Day resolution. So yesterday I was going to Missing Link. I was spending the day there, and. I realized that sometimes I, I come back in and I've not been there for two weeks and I'm almost like, oh, so much going on and I, I forget to be positive and I forget that that's my role. And yes, there was a thing I learned when I was waitering at Spur when I was 20. It was a principle called UPB, unconditional positive vibe. No matter what happens, just to smile <laughs> and be cool. And yesterday, my, my New Day's resolution was unconditional positive vibe. If somebody walks up and slaps you, smile at them and high five them back, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm very mindful and intentional about that. So I have that, and obviously I have a to-do list and action items. I believe in a principle called action learning. So I never, I never take notes when I learn. I only ever take actions. So if, if I'm watching a video or listening to a podcast, I don't write down, like I'll occasionally write down a cool quote or something. But what I'll always do is I open up uh, Google Tasks, yeah. look into my Gmail and everything, and I'll turn any note into an action. Yes. And that kind of generally forms my actions over the next period of the next week. It's do this, do that. Because I don't need to learn more, I need to do more. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a brilliant quote. I think it's by John Doerr, and Doerr, and he's uh, and he mentions that you know we're going to create more value than we consume. You know, and that's I think today's challenge with our culture is that we're con continuously consuming with like podcasts and book, and we take all this in, but we're not actioning it out. You know, so yeah, dude, I'm getting I'm getting knowledge fatigue. I actually I do a weekly podcast on Gareth Tiffshire. Yeah, and uh, I actually that was the topic this week is that I feel like we're learning far too much. I, everybody's learning shit, but no, a lot of people I see, 
when I catch up with them, I ask them, uh, you know, what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you learning? And they'll tell me a hundred things. And I ask them, what are you doing differently? And very little. And that's problematic for me. Read yeah. less. Uh, you know, I remember once reading a book. There's a book by Howard Mann called Your Business Quick Guide. And the problem is you can read this book in, in maybe an hour and a half. The discipline is to read it in a month. Because actually you should read each three-page section. And then you should sit down and you should think about it. Tom Peters said once that that's not a book that entrepreneurs should read. It's a book that entrepreneurs should have in their back pocket. But you're supposed to read it and then think about it and then actually turn it into something. The same with the book of your by Simon Goodrow. Uh, but we, we're so wanting to consume and learn and check things off Goodreads uh, that we... Uh, exactly. That's why I actually took down my, my yearly... I always had a reading goal. And I thought, I'm not reading... I'm, quant I'm measuring my, my reading progress in quantity. Yeah. But did I do 30 books this year? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's bullshit. Anyway, yeah, I feel we're both we, out of time. I think we're also going to change our reading goals to our get stuff done goals. But listen, thanks, exactly. for, thanks for joining us today. I mean, how can the, the audience reach out to you? You know, it's you know, Twitter, um, Instagram, or yeah. Yeah, like, uh, my, like I share videos every week on YouTube. It's uh, Richard Mulholland TV or Rich Mulholland TV. Oh, I love uh, those. Those are brilliant. So, so, what are you. some of the episodes again on that? So I've done a new one. The latest one was on why people are failing at their bucket lists. Brilliant. And the okay. spoiler alert is because they don't have a bucket list. They say, oh, it's on my bucket list. Oh, yeah. where's your list? Yeah, that's bullshit. So. I write that shit down. Uh, and, but that one, the, probably the easiest way to see those things is facebook.com forward slash Richard Mulholland. Yeah, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm Rich Mulholland because they don't let you have my full name. <laughs> I became rich. The world knows me as rich because Twitter wouldn't let me have my full name. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, well, uh, thanks yeah. a lot for, uh, for thanks a lot for joining the show. Let's uh, touch base and hopefully bring you on in the future. Give it a high five. Awesome. Thank Woo. you.